Dakota traditions tell of the creation of the Dakota people in their homeland of Minnesota eons ago. For hundreds of years after the arrival of Europeans in North America, the Dakota people continued to live and prosper in many communities on the upper Mississippi and Minnesota rivers. Through treaties signed in the 19th century, the Dakota ceded land to the U.S. government but continued to live on reservations on the Minnesota River into the early 1860s. I think this language here is spiritual. I think God gave you the talent. I used to go to uh, Harriet's place down here and Elsie and them up there and Bessie and them. And Josephine, and you know, I noticed that the, especially Harriet and them, they were so happy when they got together to talk Indian. It seemed like it relieved them of something, and it made them so happy. So I'd sit there and listen. There was no English language; it was all Indian. Growing up here in um in granite. From the time we were little, only everybody spoke Dakota. The whole community, I think, majority of people spoke Dakota. And um, growing up as a child here, you know, I can remember uh, my my parents, great grandparents. We all lived together, and it was so nice. Um, we lived down by uh, the river, the Minnesota River there. And um, all I can remember is um, the quietness of their voices. That's the one thing that sticks in my mind. Hearing Dakota all the time was just so comforting. Everybody uh, talked Dakota. That's, I couldn't talk English when I, went, when I started school. And of course, we didn't have no kindergarten. Uh, uh, buses didn't have kindergarten kids. Of course, we didn't have no car. <laughs> and uh, if I wanted to go to kindergarten, I suppose I'd have to walk. And at that time, we lived about four miles from town. Uh, so we kind of, Indian boys kind of started late. I would say when I was, uh, a little boy, I think 
I would say that uh, about 90% of the, the people on the hill spoke Dakota. Just about everybody. The only ones that never spoke were the, the kids, the littles. And even some of those were still pretty good then too. My grandmother and grandfather brought us up. Uh, my dad would come and see us once in a while, but my grandma and grandpa was our mother and father. And they spoke the Dakota language all the time. I very ever seldom heard him speak any English. So we understood it when we were little, but as growing up, we weren't allowed to talk it in school, so we eventually forgot it. I can understand some of the language yet, but not all of it. When I was growing up, my family, my mother and dad spoke, uh, spoke the language. And they used to talk to, uh, you know, themselves, and they talked. And I caught on to their language, and I didn't, I didn't know English. When I went to school, I had a hard time. Then when we shot up each other, and such a stuff, first grade, first grade, I began to speak Chamo. That means I flunked first grade. <laughs> I think the best thing I enjoyed more of grandma and grandpa is they would take us to powwows. You know, even if it was just us, they would take us to different towns and we would. Grandpa would sing and we would dance. The kid, us kids, would dance. We took second place at a float. We rode a float. That was nice. And then we'd get in the wagon, and we had said we're going on a big trip. Where are you going? We're going Redwood Falls. <laughs> <laughs> we go Redwood Falls in a team of horses and tie up the horses, and then and then we stay overnight. Well, I was a little kid like that, small little boy. I just barely learned to walk, and here I was dancing. So they used to take us to the fair. And we were dancing real hard for ourselves in here. Here they was throwing money out there, my grandpa and grandma. <laughs> we are getting all the money. We didn't get nothing. We didn't even know what's going on. So them things, you know, I laugh at them nowadays when I hear them. I had another aunt that she lived in Pipestone. We went to visit, and uh, the car said, oh, geez, I'm playing outside, playing outside with all my cousins on there, just really tired uh, when I come in. And, you know, we don't have the two-room house or something, just a bedroom and the kind of living room. Ma slept, she slept on the couch. And, of course, we kids, we slept on the floor, which is fine. You know, I wasn't... And I remember that night hearing... It's like there was boxes or something. Well, somebody was messing with boxes. Oh, were you there then? Yeah, yeah. Who was oh, and I went to sleep. That was a ghost. Yeah. I went to sleep and because uh, I was so tired from playing. But the next day, she, my mom, she asked uh, 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 Bob Wilson, what was going on last night? And, uh, of course, Bob, he only talks Dakota, so he says... Uh, he says, ho, 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 uh, kind of means like, uh, I always just hear when I was young. It always means kind of again. The implication was is that the ghost was was doing his his thing again. It was, In other words, it wasn't an isolated uh, time. <clears throat> and I, I don't know if I'm translating this right, but Every time, I used to hear wana ke a lot when I was young. Wana ke this, wana ke that. And it was always, it, it was. next. Yeah, it was like, uh, wana ke, what did he do now? It was always seemed to be, it was, it seemed to be 
something negative. It was never when I care. He, uh, somebody else did something good. It was always when I care. When I care, he, uh, he said, "Got DWI again?" When I care or something. When people used to come around and visit each other on the gravel road, you can hear them in Nahum out there. You know, you can hear them on the gravel road coming. And uh, the kids, some kids will run ahead and they, they see who it is. And if they're Indians coming, go get Churro, go get Churro, there's Indians coming. <laughs> we played games. We played games like um, in the in the winter, I think it was more like card games or cheesy. Uh, and then when we go to a like a community thing, all the, even the grown-ups, we are like when we'd go to Prairie Island, we'd, we'd play game, we'd play games, even the grown-ups, and we'd we'd we like in this big hall, we they had these big benches, there'd be four of them, and they all sat all around, and we they tied up this piece of cloth with a, out into a ball, and so we threw that, and that's that was. That was one of our games. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you this one story when I was a young, young guy. My grandfather and I were walking up the road to a, to a there should be a store up there where Amos Owens lives. And, uh, or did live, I should say. And anyway, we used to go up there to get kerosene for our lamps, you know. So one day we were headed up that way, and uh, right outside there, a guy named Harry Whipple was alive then. And uh, he, he seen us walking up the road. He was eating something, you know. And he says, Solomon, huh? He says, go out, go to Chichi, I can get to know. He says, you know, he says, I'll tell you something, he says. My stay, why she took the old boom I up, you know, he says, you know, they amaze me. So to me here, he says, I'll go to you out the head. Ice cream, I have cancer. Huh? I took her to talk to Mr. Weiss, he's got a stand of says, you know. And so he says, and I used to go boom by after that. Chaka can't eat it too, but that deck of ice cream is, he don't cream, cream was for the ice. So he took the breeze from the ice, he says. I remember things like that. This is the story I heard from my aunt. You know, she, they had a little cradle board or whatever that is. They put me up there in a tree and then they were making blankets. And here the blue jays kept diving down on me, you know, mm -hmm. when I was up there. And, I, and they didn't know what was going on. Nobody knew what was going on. So my grandma told my grandpa, you better go over there and see what's going on over there. There's birds are diving down on him. So he went, when he walked over there, there was a bull snake crawling up there. He was trying to get in there. My, he was trying to get in my cradle. He heard the blue jays were diving down and knocked him off of that tree. <laughs> so then they called me blue jay after that for a long time. Yeah. So, you know, that's one story that uh, mm -hmm. I always think that's interesting myself. Mm -hmm. Well, we grew up in an Indian language home, though. Our parents spoke Indian right along, and when we were real young, uh, we sure didn't forget the commands, like when you learn to be quiet. If we went to meetings or if we went to things, we. We could just look at them, but we know what they <laughs> sit there and be quiet. But we learned, uh, we learned without them raising their voice, without them hollering at us. They could just look at us or raise their hand or something, and we already knew what they meant. And part of that is the Indian language. The language is so different that when they say something to you, like when they even say your name in Indian, then you could feel the love, you could feel the kindness that, that goes behind it. In 1862 uh, is a pivotal year 
um, both in terms of facts and then in terms of story. And um, so, uh, uh, because that's when uh, the conflict of 1862, the Dakota War, uh, whatever, wherever you sit on the spectrum of what it was called, that it was a pivotal, earth-shaking thing in the lives of all kinds of people. The devastating events of 1862 U.S. Dakota War changed things forever. As a result of 1862, the U.S. government renounced the Dakota treaties and the Dakota were exiled from Minnesota to reservations in Nebraska and South Dakota. Only a few Dakota were allowed to remain in Minnesota. During the 1870s and the 1880s, the exiled Dakota began to return to Minnesota to rejoin their relatives. Federal appropriations led to the purchase of land at Morton, Granite Falls, Prior Lake, Prairie Island, and Wabasha. In some cases, the decision to buy lands at these places were made because Dakota people had already bought small pieces of land there. Growing up, they always talked about 1862 the things that happened there, and uh, I remember the stories of the forced march. I grew up hearing those stories. The mm -hmm. elders would talk about those things. The forced march to uh, Fort Snelling, uh, the hanging. And so I always knew that, but I never could find out in the history books. It's like nobody knew outside our family. And so um, my mom used to tell us, and maybe she wanted to make sure we never forgot about what happened to our relatives. Um, we've lost people on that, that march. And so that's always been a memory in our family. And so um, I always told my kids, my kids have been raised on, on those stories and uh, made sure that they never forgot what happened to our people here in Minnesota. And the journey, uh, depending on who and what facts you want to look at, the people went from here um, on a march, uh, the march split down by um, south of New Ulm a little ways, and the people, the women and children and old men went to Fort Snelling or what's below Fort Snelling to the prison camp and the men were marched then down to the prison camp in Mankato, which ultimately ended up in the riverboats taking the people from Fort Snelling in the spring of 1863 to Crow Creek in what is now South Dakota. And the um, men in the prison camp ended up uh, either being hung on December 26, 1862, or those that didn't get hung ended up at the um, uh, prison camp in Fort Davenport, Iowa. Uh, he was not a good person. He was 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 a オーディオンクテラピー。ダクスタオーディオンクテラピー。
Yeah, my grandma used to mm. talk mm. about it. But then she said, Doc Ishni, mm. don't say anything. Mm. Don't tell anybody. Mm. If you tell them, they'll put you in jail. Mm. Or you accept it, or they'll kill you. Mm. Yeah. I listened, and I never repeated it. Mm. Yeah. Because of what she said. She said, the government officials find out, she said, they'll do away with you. An agency was established at Birch Cooley, now called Morton, as well as a day school for Indian students. In 1891, a federal appropriation established a day school, which opened its doors at Pipestone two years later. The school was intended for all tribes in the United States. In later years, the Dakota students were far outnumbered by students from other tribes. But within a few years of opening of the school, the superintendent took over the duties as Indian agent for Dakota and Minnesota. My mom and dad spoke um, the language, but it was always when they didn't want us to know, you know, those stories. So um, I remember little, I thought, well, gee, this must be bad or something that they don't want us to learn this. And, and now I, I realize why. You know, they both went to boarding schools, and, and that's why that was. While the Pipestone Agency and school were intended to improve the welfare of the Dakota by giving them improved housing, medical care, food, and income, these benefits disguised the pressure on Dakota people to abandon their traditional culture and their Dakota language. The goal of the school and other government schools where Dakota children were sent was to teach them subjects that would prepare them for getting jobs in the American economy, on farms, in cities, and in factories. Continuing to speak the Dakota language was not encouraged, although some Dakota children who attended Pipestone and other government schools still spoke Dakota with their parents and grandparents in their homes. <laughs> Pipestone, Minnesota School of Hanawa Yudabdi Gama. My Takika on Kuapi, Kokshida Picking. A Taku ruler, Taku hair carpet, eh? Eh, no, Naha Mampipu chair. To Hando Kota Wawa Hadaka Wachinka. Etched Mushkampi Gachan. Hatched head, Takin and Dakota Hanai Wahodak of Snitcher. He won't ruler king, Taco head carpet king, eh? Hona a mumpy pitcher, Unki of Mumpy P. The Hatched head works we have wanted. Now to Flanner, Indian school. But it's altogether a different different atmosphere, different setting, different everything. <laughs> yeah, they're all Indians, you is. Uh, of course, there's different kinds of Indians, but <laughs> but they're all Indians. No more shichus. To what a talk, Epshnit guy. Hitch at school, you have to have my use of me, okay, Epshnit. A stogi bdabit chair, taku kuna. A bdabit chair. I don't know school or nama unshin. I'm petoking the Morton Tava Iga. Eh, unkana me talking. They taku. You won't teach you picking. The archuk that car. Hatched me cool up, kinha. Taku on Chumpiki was take a ish was testing. Ka ni peppy and young we can head she chak chigger. Dakota go, Taku do the chumo keeps me. I took care of the social services, uh, Indian Child Welfare Act. I had to go to courts with the kids' um, parents. 
over the system. See that they are all uh, enrolled members before you can help them. Sometimes you have to be an enrolled member. And you gotta be so much Indian. So I had to go by those rules. I was sent to a school with my sister. They were given some homework and some books and stuff to read. And we started talking English in the house. My dad forbid us the talk English because of, he said, your mother don't understand, your grandma don't understand. People are coming here to visit, they don't, they don't understand what you're talking about. So it was confusing at eight because of trying to talk English and try to talk Indian. And the same thing was happening at school. Couldn't talk Indian in school. And then you couldn't talk Indian at home. Mm -hmm. So it was confusing for me. And when I finally told my dad, I said, you know, what, what are we supposed to be talking? You know? He said, well, around home, you talk Indian. Dakota Yapi Echera, almost way. And why are we in the Dakota Yapi Echera? And in a Tahike. Uspeki, Hena. Taco, you have to buy it. Okay. Not bad, eh? Na. Tahia, eh? Waku, eh? Na. Ma shuju ya pi eh? Awek tunje. Dakota ya pi eh? Epe. And in a chance, and that's your Hinaji here. He had him on out here. And a bed at Dutchy, but do he? Eh, no, Chow, you know, Mazo had Taku. I can Yeah. We don't speak that devil's language here. We speak English. And then, here up here, I can't am up here. Nina Ksumayam. Nakote yapi ki he, he told, Tuwe tawachi ed eki hinake ga. Gihan yu nina. Onach unwa shte che eb. Dakota i apik a Dakota o doa. Hena Dakota o yate. Tawab hena doa pkiha. Nina onach unwa shte. Ka woche ki e ab hena na pu. Ito hena no won spe kua. Hena uspeb chegahan Uma Naka ichara ub hena uspeb kia Dakota ya piki he tosta katina yekta Mishechen Mitawa chink a he ohne He wana washkawa chink to hire waki kia One night I was praying, they asked me what I want because I'm always praying for Indians And I was told that uh, Indians forgot how to love and I really felt bad, and I said, you know, that can't be. And here it is. We forgot our way of life, the way we were taught. It was born right into us, just like the color of our skin. We have to get back to it, I think. And language is a part of it, a big part, because even when they speak, you can feel the difference. When Indians stand up and speak, when they pray, there's a way difference from just just saying a prayer from a piece of paper or something. Mm -hmm. They speak from their heart. In the 1930s, Dakota communities were encouraged because of the passage of the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act to organize with their own constitutions and governing councils, increasing the number of decisions they could make about their own lives. However, because of the previous federal land purchases, 
Dakota were not allowed to organize as a single people, but instead as small separate communities at Upper Sioux, Pajuta Zizi, Lower Sioux, Chanchayapi, Prairie Island, Tintawinta, and later Shakopee, Bede Mayato in 1969. <laughs> Okay, I remember my dad specifically um, uh, when I got older and a teenager going through all the angst and the weirdness of teenagers is that we would get into arguments and fights and things as all teenagers do. I don't want to make it sound like I was knocked off. That was kind of fights, but you know, the testing of wills kind of stuff. And I was talking to my dad and I said, um, I, somehow we got going and I said, well, how can we never learn the language, you know, and stuff like that. And he said, I made a decision after my experiences that you kids would never learn the language. Um, and part of the reason why I raised you here, because we were fighting over all kind of, you know, why I was raised here and why I couldn't go to boarding school and stuff like that. He said, the reason why I raised you here is so you'd never have to do that. Yeah, I think it was way different when we were little. Then they didn't, one way they didn't want us to speak it, then we just had to speak English. Did they ever say why they didn't talk no. about that? No. They just, no, I never remember anybody telling us why we couldn't speak Indian, but. They didn't at the time, but later on they explained that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was because they were punished, they didn't want us you know, to uh, be punished that way for speaking the language. No, Mish, Pejut is easy to copy Hitchia, Wai Hehan, when you do Akema Zapta Hehan, Hitchia Wai, Dekshi Wai Hapi. Nako Hitchia Wau Hehan, Dakota Yapi Nawah. The Wichashta Numpa Dakotia Wohedakapi Unka He Dakuhe Ateweye Imuhe Atewe Omakiake He Dakotiapi Oha He on Spemi Chicha Wachi On Spemayaki Oyaki He Ateweye Mayopte Hia Oaki Shne Mijami Chingshi Omakshi the Heahan Inaway he, imuhe. Dakota unspe maya kekta. Ina kunshi waye, unku, eye, hia hawaki ishni, washichupiki hana, he chimp shni, washichun kia pikta, chimpi, oni washtikte, he chanukahan. Despite being given the right to reorganize their communities, the forces of change have continued to pressure them in ways that encourage the abandonment of traditional culture, beliefs, and language. In the 1950s, the Minnesota Dakota, like many other tribes, were encouraged by the Relocation Act of 1956 and forced by economic pressures to leave their communities and get jobs in the cities. One ray of hope for Dakota traditions was the work begun by Dakota speakers in 1969 at the University of Minnesota to preserve and teach the Dakota language. Um, Minnesota wants to work on the TV. Yet he took a hair, each of which has the Oyake, you have to give her Omaka. Opawenge a kenab chiwanka sam wikchemna shak pe sam nab chiwanka. He 1969, he he tahano 
the Kotak a Hahatwa. I api ki he yu hashkampi. He de taha tukahea. Imawaga ka he chamu o aki hi. By your very presence being here shows that you have demonstrated an interest, an uh, uh, invested interest in learning the language or promoting the language use in our communities, in our homes, in our families. And so we kind of want to have a discussion. Ohni am petu i ohi mish. Imani ha che. Hatani wa iki ha. Imani ha nga i omak pi che de da kota i apiki. Daya yu ha o shkampi ka. Dena wo spek wa wa shi chunga da kota. Ka oyate tok tok che da kota i abhede un spepi chimpi na ka. Un spewi chong ki api. Family history, Roderick Waji Echamo. Uh, uh, me Sapa me hunka, a tea toka, uh, Waji, uh, Daku, Muhe, a witch of Muhe watching. Um, uh, uh, Ogana Wayega, Mushi Wayeg, and our Makia Kapi. Uh, Yapi Waji, when you happy. Uh, Dakota Yapi. A woman had a cup. A happy. Uh, um, a donha. Uh, Yapi King there was baby chich at watching. Oh, huh. I could tell her hair. Hey, Ibaduk. Unka, one year to. We extend a noon some mazapta hair hun. Dead wobbled out. Won't speak what he match a hair hun. Dakota Yapi. Won't spay me each year. One year to Numpa. Dead wash gone. Unka. The Dakota Yapig He Nina Tewahinde He on Tehan Uspe Michiche. One other day, one year to Ake Zapta Ched Dakota Yapigi Uspe Michiche. I wish that the African hair hooking in or was she to share to her proud. だこっちしてたのにあの、一緒にとのだこじの、ボシャヒエカ。え、みんな見たとんど。あ、で、コットヤピ、うんすべいちちやぽ。あ、ヤピ金でうんすべいにちちやぽ。あ、ストニちちや
she don't have that now. She, she won't look at it. Oh, she never did go. It's a dead. Diane, the court, the Iaki, Unach, was there a pet. The court, the Iapiki head. Unach, was dead car. Oh, Nina, wah, Uchni, a pound kind. Hey, I guess she, we koshka kept. Ihaga hair. Ha, he deny I guess they don't cut up in a car and I de she checked the cotter yap you. Oh, new spare with chunk yap ye air. Oh, he was stay a pair. He de na chick on a car head. Oh, she deck a yetchy egg he was dead. Head head up with a no. He shake a richy our chinched it kai to where he de talk here the cotter yanka. Hekchi wah da ka wachin. No, he tan shi tok cha shni e mi jya da koti ya pi ki he he wa shte wa shte wa ki da ka ye shte. That was in a Target store in St. Paul. I think uh, when we were little, it, you almost didn't want to be an Indian. As soon as you got to school, you were a savage, a little Indian getting beat and hit and standing in the hall, getting her hands hit and on this side and in the back. And but you, you didn't even want to be an Indian. You thought it was something bad or something wrong with you. As you get older and learn the history and stuff, that's where we have to come back. We have to be remembered that we're brown, we're Indian, we're never going to change. That's us. So we would have to wake up and remember who we are. We're Indian. We have to be proud, proud to be an Indian and learn the language. And that's what's going to help us the most, to, to speak our language. Then we are who we are. Well, next to need to do a conversation with Dago and she is here, which is a little happy. Na go he uh uh ish ni dakota ye which ho ha u hadu happy. Na go he unkoka negabi unkoki hippi. Uh dog star ke da unko tapik. That's where my thoughts are with the younger generation. I I have great grandchildren now, and I want them to know always who they are. And they're from different tribes too, but you know, we are all one people. Bringing the language back. What, what are some things that you would want us to know about doing that? Well, you gotta talk Indian all the time. Yeah your family. I think the language is, it never, never should have stopped the learning, but then you got to remember how many generations that they, they, they didn't speak in the house. The uh, language itself, I don't think it'll ever go away. But people are, you know, for a long time there, those people didn't want to learn. My first language is Dakota, and my second language is Washichu, and that's that's the way it's been all my life. And uh, I was born when we used nothing but the Dakota language in, in the home, but we had to learn when we went to the the white school. And but it was easy to learn because it was a sense of survival to be able to speak Washichu. And we are survivors, Dakota people are, Native people are survivors. Dakota Wichoha is a Minnesota nonprofit with a mission to revive the Dakota language and pass it on to future generations. Our goal is intergenerational learning, especially within family nests. Ten years ago, members of, of the communities got together and shared our concern for the loss of the Dakota language, especially among our fluent elders. Uh, so we started meeting in our homes, in the communities, and decided to form a nonprofit 
to do that work of Dakota language revitalization. That's a good way of option, yeah. Uh, just do what you can to learn your language. And then, sh and then share it with somebody. Don't just learn it, you gotta share it with somebody. When people are learning the Dakota language, uh, have compassion for them, and um, I guess, uh, I won't say pity them, but it, the Dakota word means more of, uh, if you want to help them and nurture them, so that as they learn the Dakota language, they don't, um, that spirit of wanting to learn isn't snuffed out. Because um, so often, you know, that was, the language was beaten out of our elders. So today, in this uh, day and age, a lot of elders are afraid to speak because they were probably raised um, or went to boarding schools where they were beaten if they spoke their language. So, so that generation of our elders are still struggling. Um, so as we try to relearn our language and as our children, grandchildren, uh, we learn the language. Uh, just have compassion for each other as we learn. First thing you gotta understand about the language, there's the right drug in it. No matter how you say whatever words, that's how you know it. Where you grew up, that's probably how you learned from your parents or the community or whatever. They took me to a, a family household, and they're young, young. Young people, and they spoke Dakota in the house, and even the children. Mm. Yeah, so it was good to hear that. That the children were learning too. Little tiny babies, mm. they speak Dakota to them. Kud iaha, shantaka kud iaha. What do you think about? <clears throat> the uh, younger generation trying to, you know, learn it now. Yeah. You know, I think that's really a great thing, especially with the people that have already have learned it. That if they do it within the household, boy, that's, that's a good, uh, good way to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be compassionate because there's a lot of learners out there, and they want to know what's Dakota, who is Dakota, and we need to help each other and treat each other well, and um, not discourage each other from learning. And don't give up either, you know. Sometimes elders have said, oh, you sound like a Washichu person speaking Dakota. They've said that to me. and. So you kind of have to have like some thick skin. If in some way going to uh, be an advantage to our younger generation, that's what I want to see. They will carry that language. It, it'll never be like it was 7,500 years ago. It will be close to that if we work all together, everyone work together toward that goal. And I think it's something that Native people should look at. Um, younger sister, Epazo. Today, Dakota people, despite the challenges faced by their parents and grandparents to survive and preserve their traditions, Dakota people in many places are experiencing a cultural rebirth through remembering the past, reclaiming their place in the world, and reconnecting the circle of Dakota tradition. You guys are really doing a good thing because we have to keep our language alive. I mean, not just the Dakotas, but all of the nations that are losing their language. Because once we lose our language, we no longer exist as a nation. We are Dakota and our children should be taught that. 
who we were is what we want to try to get back to. And I think it's going in the right direction. And I do see it. I do see it in so many different ways that we are trying to help our younger people to be who they are. Damakota. You were saying something very great and honorable when you say, I am a Dakota. Grandma, grandpa, cousins, brothers, sisters, everybody's in. Somebody goes, okay. So, I want you Indian people, the Dakota people, Something good happened to you. Yesterday, I was like, whoa, I had to get you. Oh, you tell me. Oh, gosh, she...